Thanks, Tony, and uh, thank you for your welcome, Archie. Uh, let me say that uh, the following is not a sermon. Uh, indeed, it's not even a lecture. It's more like a discussion starter. Uh, I'm doing something here which I don't think I've ever done before, and uh, uh, that's good. It's been a challenge, uh, but uh, after today, I may totally rewrite it and do it again. Uh, not to this audience, uh, presumably. Uh, but uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, and very, very glad indeed, and uh, glad that the, uh, that the coronation and all that's gone with it has begun us thinking about these things. Uh, in preparation for it, I got in touch with uh, a, a gentleman called Professor Nicaroni in uh, Queensland. Uh, his, uh, he's a constitutional lawyer, uh, a keen Christian of a Presbyterian type. Um, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> and he's written many things. Uh, and he very, very kindly uh, had a Zoom conversation with me and Philip chipped in as well. Uh, and I want to say that nothing, he is not responsible for anything you're about to hear. Uh, yeah, this is his most recent book, uh, which is ed he edited it, and it's really called Christianity and Constitutionalism. It's got about 20 or 30 authors. Uh, it's formidable, absolutely formidable. Uh, I've read the introduction uh, and <laughs> dipped into other things. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the, exactly the sort of thing that, uh, you know, some of us ought to be getting into. Um, and if you want to, uh, it's in the Moore College Library, except it's not. I've got it at the moment, so don't try. Uh, there's a number of other books he has. But he's a, he's a, a distinguished gentleman, and we ought to be very pleased that he's uh, such a keen Christian and that uh, getting things together like this. Uh, can I commend Nicaroni to you? But remember, he's not responsible for this. Okay. Uh, now, I want to say, uh, to, to uh, basically do uh, the following, a, a brief introduction, uh, then something really called the fundamentals, and then I'm going to go to two principles. I know that's not on the list there, but I wrote the outline a week ago, and I am still preparing as I'm talking to you, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, and then some implications of those principles, and you'll notice how carefully I prepared, because each of the implications starts with the letter A, and uh, that's an indication that I spent more time on that than I spent thinking about the talk. <laughs> it's a bit stupid when you think about it, but there we are. I had fun doing that. Okay, we turn to the introduction, uh, and I've called it to rule and be ruled. Uh, universe, uh, sorry, a big pun, a, a dictionary definition of government, first of all. Um, a quarry dictionary, quote, to rule by right of authority. To rule by right of of authority. And I checked a few other dictionaries and yep, that's it, to rule by right of authority. Uh, that means that um, government is not simply a matter of Macquarie Street and uh, Canberra, but it's a universal thing. Uh, government occurs everywhere and it's a permanent thing, permanent to human experience, whether it's governing a, an empire, a nation, uh, a tribe, a governing an institution like Moore College, for example, uh, governing a team uh, such as who doesn't want to be an Australian today, uh, cricket, um, governing a workplace, governing a family. All these things really can be places where government is exercised. And I want to make that point because I want to, I want to recognise that we're all involved in government either giving it or receiving it, but in your life, almost certainly, you will be involved in governing in some sense or other, uh, if you're not now. Uh, we govern and we are governed, usually both, and, uh, uh, and almost certainly all of us. Uh, now, this uh, talk has been especially inspired, of course, by the, by the coronation, and so the focus will be on the nation, but I want us to see the nation as simply part of a much bigger picture of what government is. Um, we live in the nation of Australia. Uh, to my mind, uh, I think it is one of the best places on earth. And I'm not just saying that as a patriot. Uh, I think as you look around, uh, we are truly blessed to be living in this country. And it's not only because of the wealth of the country and the riches, the inherent riches and all that sort of stuff, but it is because of government. 
Uh, it's interesting that uh, there's a register, you could look it up, an index, I should say, called the Corruption Index. Uh, look it up, it's very interesting indeed. It gives a list of, what is it, 160 different countries and the level of corruption in each country. Now, I think corruption kills more people than famine does. It's, just, it's a terrible, terrible blight, one of the world's worst evils. Uh, on the Corruption Index, we have forgotten where we come, we're in about 10, something like that. The Scandinavians come first because they've got no imagination, but apart from that, uh, I say that as a Jensen. It was a joke. All right. Um, but the uh, uh, Scandinavians do, do tend to come first. Uh, Singapore is up there, uh, but Australia is well up on the list of places which are not corrupt. Now, just think for a moment. You, you take this for granted, maybe, unless you come from another place and you know better, but you take this for granted. It is one of the greatest blessings you can possibly imagine that you are not constantly being asked by people for money to do things which they ought to be doing for free, or, so to speak, for free. Australia is one of the best places in the world for that reason alone, but so many others as well. We have law and order. Uh, we, uh, uh, we are not under army control. Uh, there's no sort of um, uh, generals running us or something like that. We're not a dictatorship. Uh, uh, we are truly blessed. Thank God for that. And we ought to smile because many, many people do not experience this. And in God's mercy, we do. We may well ask ourselves, inspired by the coronation, why? It's not obvious. Uh, if I say we are not a corrupt nation, generally speaking, we're not a corrupt nation compared to others, ah, oh, that's because we're better people, yes? We just happen to be superior. Is that it? Forget it. We could be just as corrupt as anybody else, but we're not. And the question is, why is that the case? To my mind, it has got something to do with the sources of our democracy and running back, in the end, the sources of our democracy are biblical. Um, and uh, if you think of the coronation, it was held in a church. It was a Christian ceremony, very interestingly. So what is the secret? What is the secret of a nation which has been so blessed and what must we do to guard uh, the democracy which we have? Are the questions that are buzzing in my mind. And as I say, I'm going to start with a couple of fundamentals, principles, and then implications. Here we go. Ready? OK, so the, fundam the two fundamentals that I think are essential for recognition of this. Uh, this is human reality, the reality of being a human, whether people recognise it or not. Many people don't acknowledge it, but I would say it doesn't matter uh, that this is the truth and this is the world in which we live. As I say, we have been confronted with it by the coronation, which was a church service. It was parallel to what you may call a covenant uh, moment, uh, God's gift uh, of a covenant God's commands and the king's oath of office. Uh, so the two realities, the two fundamentals are, first of all, that God rules this world. It's not by accident that the Bible speaks of God's kingdom. He is the king, he is the creator, he owns all things, he runs all things, he's not detached, he's not disinterested, he is deeply concerned with the running of this world and everything in it, and he is the king of this world. He has placed human beings in this world and he rules over us through his word. He rules over us through his word and his people truly, if they are to be his people, will obey his word uh, as they live in the place which God has provided. Now, a great deal has happened. I don't need to go into all that's happened. You know because you're living in the midst of it. Uh, but of course, as we know, the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Uh, and the God's kingdom in this period, God's kingdom is expressed through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is true man and true God. 
He, he is the one through whom God's kingdom is experienced in this world. Uh, it was interesting the uh, way in which uh, Mark chapter 10 verse 45 figured in the, con in the coronation where Jesus said, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And he was speaking to his disciples who wanted to be kings and rulers and to have power. And he said, no, look at me. I have come not to be served, but to serve and indeed serve in the, in the, in the giving up of his life in sacrifice. Uh, thus setting out a pattern for human rule, human government is service. How does Christ rule? We read uh, 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 Isaiah 11 verses 1 to 10. There are many passages we could turn to, but Isaiah 11, 1 to 10 is a picture of the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and it tells us of one who is to come, the Messiah, fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is possessed, uh, you could hardly say uh, less, he is possessed by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the Lord rests upon him, the spirit of uh, wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He is possessed by the spirit of God and he is empowered by the spirit of God for judicial activity, for judging, uh, for governing. Uh, the wisdom and understanding, the counsel and the might, these words are indicating this for strategy, if you like, for strategy and for strength in living as the king of this people. Uh, he uh, labours in the fear of the Lord, as ought all human beings, uh, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he administers his kingdom with justice. Verse 3, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, outwardly, and decide dispute by what his ears hear, he will judge with righteousness and he'll judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, etc. He rules with justice and he rules with compassion. Justice, compassion. And he provides security against the wicked. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, just with his word and with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Justice compassion, security. He provides for his people. He rules with righteousness. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness, the belt of his loins. Righteousness, good purposes, in other words, and faithfulness, that is, dependability and integrity, mark the, mark the leadership, the governorship of this governor, this king, this ruler. And in so doing, of course, he provides for our salvation, but he also provides a model for the way in which true government should be exercised. There's a purposiveness to it. That's what I mean by towards the end. There is a purposiveness to the whole thing. For God rules his people through covenant. A covenant is a promise. A promise is something that looks into the future and provides you with a structure, a safe structure for the future. When you make a promise, uh, you're meant to keep it. That means a person can trust you and trust your promises. Unfortunately, human beings don't always keep their promises. You may have noticed that. But these promises, the promises of God's covenant, are absolutely fulfilled always. Indeed, we're told, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. He is the great fulfillment of the covenant promises of God and they and uh, the, uh, the complete fulfillment will come at the end of this age when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the goat and so forth and so on. When there'll be a new heavens and a new earth in which will dwell righteousness. So God's government is not just governing day by day. God's government is purposive. It is moving towards a great and glorious end, a wonderful end when uh, Christ shall hand over the kingdom to his Father and God will be all in all, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So what do we see as we think of the fun these fundamental of God the ruler? We see the following things. First, that God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, all mentioned, is the true king, governor and authority. He's the one and he alone is the one. 
Any authority we have, therefore, does not stem from us, but is given to us as a gift. Our authority is a gifted authority, and we need to recognise that. It doesn't come from the strength of our right arm or the brilliance of our brain. It comes delegated to us by God himself. Furthermore, we see that there is no human leader other than the Lord Jesus Christ, both God and man. Uh, there is no human leader. There is no human leader who is God. There have been temptations in times past to worship human leadership. We are told here, no, no matter how great, no matter how wonderful, no matter what an empire is ruled by your Caesar or your Napoleon Bonaparte or whoever it is, they are not God and must not be worshipped as God. There is always that warning, do not worship at the shrine of some great leader, for you have your leader and that leader is Jesus Christ. And all authorities are accountable to God all authority is accountable. Whether they believe in God or not makes no difference. All authority is accountable to God and they will have to give an account of their leadership one of these days. And they should govern, therefore, by the word of God. And I've said that you're a leader. I've said there are moments when you will be governing or perhaps years when you will be governing, when you will have governorship. And you too, it's not just the prime minister we're talking about, we're talking about human governorship, human authority wielded over others, and you will be accountable for the way in which you govern, you exercise authority. God is the governor. Now, furthermore, humanity is revolting. You may have noticed that. <laughs> we live in this groaning creation we live in a groaning creation. We are expelled from the beautiful Garden of Eden out into a world fit for sinners to live in. The Apostle says, Roman, that's uh, Romans, uh, better, better pardon, that's Genesis 3, 22 following. In Romans 8, he speaks about the world groaning as if in childbirth, as it waits for the revelation of the sons of God. Uh, this is the world we live in. In the time since the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, human beings have made progress, notably in the last couple of centuries. Uh, we, uh, we still dominate, we still have this role of ruling the world, but uh, the Tower of Babel tells us everything. Uh, in the Tower of Babel, human technology is used to build this vast tower, and the first joke of the Bible that I can think of, you know, God comes down to look at the tower, it's so far beneath him. But what we see in the story of the Tower of the Babel is the power of human technology always marred by sin. So no matter how brave we are, no matter how brilliant we are, no matter how wonderful our uh, achievements are, whether it's getting to the moon and beyond, whether it's a vast telescope, whether it's the internet, uh, whether it's building wonderful bridges, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whatever it is, we build. We have nuclear power, and we turn it into a bomb, and we bomb a city with it. We have the internet, and it's rubbishly filled with porn and other sinfulness. Indeed, and then we find that if we give too much attention to the screen, we will do damage to ourselves and to what we, how we think and and our reading capacity. We have these tech, every technological advantage we have is marred by sin. The broken image, shattered relationships. We are still image bearers. We are ruling for God. We fill the earth. We have subdued it. We do subdue it. We, our intention is that we should create order for the good of all. But now, evil has invaded every human heart. No matter who you are, no matter how nice you are, nonetheless, Evil lives within your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. Genesis 6, 5. One of the, one of the most telling uh, pictures of human evil. Genesis 6, verse 5. Where the wickedness of man is so great upon the earth that the, the Lord decides to, um, to destroy the earth. It is invaded the heart and it lives there and no one person sitting in this room is anything else but evil. Not entirely evil, we are good as well. 
but we are inherently evil and we need to know it and that's essential to understand if we're to understand government. We note, however, as image bearers of God that individuals are precious, key point, individuals are precious, and secondly, and we see this very early in Genesis, relationships define us. We are not meant to be alone. We are meant to be with others. Community, relationships. Individuals are precious, relationships define. The two things belong together. And when we get the balance wrong, things go seriously wrong. Relationships, of course, are the source of much pain and suffering, as well as joy and fulfilment. Individualism, on the other hand, leads to relational disaster, misery and pain. We must get that right. We still exercise rule as image bearers of God. We are still accountable to God, every one of us. But there is a true image, namely the Lord Jesus. He is the true image of God, God's real ruler. Colossians 1.15, the image of God. Salvation comes to an individual. I love uh, Paul's words in Galatians 2.20, the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. We all, all say that. But salvation also, and inherent in salvation, is that it recreates community. It begins the whole process. It begins the whole process. Heaven is not going to be individual and isolated. Heaven is going to be the coming together of the people of God. And even in our experience here in this, in this life, uh, as we gather with God's people, Colossians 3, 9 to 14, for example, has a picture of us gathered together and it calls upon us uh, to love one another. Uh, uh, where the apostle says, but now you must put all things away, all anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscenity. Don't lie to each other. You've put on the new self, being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. There is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave all free but Christ is all in all uh, now that's the picture of true community which is God's intention for the human race our present and our future are both personal and relational for that is how God has created us so the fundamentals for good government at all levels whether you're talking about the government of a family or the government of an empire are that God is the supreme governor that he rules in this present age through Christ and the Spirit, endowed with the Spirit. That human beings are naturally evil, not good, not entirely evil, we do good. But human beings are na naturally disposed to evil. That government therefore can channel, but not cure evil. Government can channel, but can't cure evil. And it is limited. But it needs to be recognised at all times that human beings are both individually precious and also made for relationships. And government policy ought to recognise both those things. Now, two principles flow from this very quickly. First of all, about human government. And I want to make the point again that I've made several times that it's experienced at every level. We have human government uh, and we all experience it. It is ubiquitous. And if you don't know what that means, just think of what I've just said. Uh, it is apparent in family, in sport, in work, etc., etc. Now, inherent in human government is a nasty word which nobody likes these days, and it's called hierarchy. Hierarchy, like it or not, is inherent in all human government and inherent in human relationships. It is a good, not an evil. God has introduced hierarchy. As long as we continue to recognise the preciousness of the individual and the necessity of relationships. It's essential for us to say this. There is a, an idea that if you are subordinate, you are not equal. That is a, a very dangerous thought. The prisoner 
is subordinate to the prison guard in a big way. But if the prison guard does not understand that the prisoner is his equal, then we'll have hell holes. If you go around saying, oh, if you are inferior, if you are not in the hierarchy, you are somehow inferior, you are then committing yourselves to a position of great evil because the prison guard must recognise the prisoner is his or her equal in worth, in preciousness. Otherwise, they will do great harm, much evil. Government is necessary. Hierarchy is integral. But only if it is understood that subordination does not mean inequality or lack of importance. Secondly, the two, that's one principle. There are many principles I've chosen two. The second one is to do with the human longing for freedom and order. Human government must seek to balance the needs of the individual and the community, both. Sometimes we make so much fuss about the rights of the human being, the rights of the individual, that we forget that there are rights of the community as well. So much emphasis is placed upon the individual that families are destroyed. So much emphasis is placed on the individual that communities such as schools, hospitals and so forth, which are set up for community and by community, are prejudiced. Oh, the individual comes first. No, individual preciousness and community, these two things belong together. We have anarchy on one side. We must be so pressing the individual that every individual is in charge of their own destiny. Every individual must do as he or she sees fit. We have tyranny on the other side where one person rules all. These are the extremes. These are the extremes. We must find the right place somewhere in the middle. Anarchy arises from individualism and, the, and a false view of freedom that freedom means I can do anything I like. It's a lot of nonsense. Um, tyranny arises from a lust for power and, and uh, results in collectivism, where everyone must march to the same tune and do exactly what one person orders. Individualism, collectivism. The gospel sets us free. Galatians 5 verse 1, the gospel sets us free. But true freedom is only found in order. You can only play tennis when there's a net. You can only play tennis when there are lines. True freedom is found with order, and when you have order, there you have true freedom. God cannot sin. Does that mean he's not free? No, that means he is the freest of all beings, for he cannot sin. Freedom is not just doing anything I like, freedom is doing what you ought to do. Think of love for a moment. When you love another person, whether you're in love or whether you're loving as the Good Samaritan did, you are committing yourself and your money and your time and your efforts to that other person. That other person is robbing you of your individualism. But indeed, you are exhibiting your true freedom by love for the other person. That is what I mean when I'm talking about order. And Galatians 5, 6 talks about faith working through love. Faith working through love. Thus in family life, in family life, righteousness is the aim that all things may go in accordance with the will of God. Faithfulness is the means where we live in faithfulness to each other, in truth and in integrity. In government, this is uh, so little remembered that we need to say it again, and the, this comes from the gospel. It's interesting that the parliament begins with prayer, including the Lord's Prayer, which says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, with the acknowledgement indeed that human beings, including this will surprise you, please don't repeat it outside the room, but parliamentarians are sinful. Oh, okay. I, uh, please. Uh, 
and in need of forgiveness, that rulers, even ones that acknowledge God, do commit sin. Power is given to certain people. Power is given to the king at his coronation. But it is power to serve, and that is where true liberty is to be found in the service of others. Power to serve as I love others from the depths of my own individual heart. Now, implications, implications. Uh, I have a um, couple of PowerPoints to entertain you at this point to stop me, my voice going on so much. Here is one of them. Uh, this, was, uh, this one's called the old regime. Have we got that? The old regime of telling people how to live their lives, be you a government. This was said by a, a, a leading politician, let me say, uh, who occupied high office. He says, the old regime, be you a government or a churchman, is running out of time. Australians want to be free. They want to have their independence. They want to have choice. And then, now there are some people who distrust human nature. Ah, oh, I suppose he has keys to his car, does he? Yes, probably. And believe in his house? Yes, he has a big fence around his house. Uh, and they believe that people won't make the right decisions and that others should make these decisions for them. We err on the side of respecting individual judgment and respecting individual choices, and err is the right word. <laughs> Meant well. Now, here's a cartoon that appeared, and it's got me in it. Yes, I love it. <laughs> and you may know just the other person, who's actually the same height as me, to tell you the truth. He and I have known each other since we were teenagers. It's Mr. Howard. And it, this arose at a uh, press conference when I was first made Archbishop, and being particularly silly as I was uh, in those days, uh, no doubt uh, I was asked the question about what would you say to the, to the Prime Minister about, uh, I think it was the boat people at that stage, what would you say to the Prime Minister about the boat people? And I said in my naivety, I said, I would say, Mr Prime Minister, read your Bible. And hence this cartoon arrived. Uh, are you listening to God using a marginal electorate? Thank you. It's brilliant. I love it. The, uh, the cartoonist sent me a copy of it, which I <laughs> sent me the original of it, which I have. What I was I trying to say to Mr. Howard, I have great respect for John Howard, as a matter of fact. Uh, and as I say, we've known each other since we were teenagers, and I do have great respect for him, and I certainly wasn't trying to be rude. On the contrary, what I was saying was, it's not my business as an archbishop, i.e. church, to tell the prime minister what to do, except to say, read your Bible. You must make your decisions as prime minister. You are in touch with God. Now listen to what God is saying. Rather than telling him what policy he should adopt. He's the politician, he has to do that. I'm not the politician. But I do have to say to him, read your Bible. That was the intention <laughs> anyway. I was trying to respect his Christian integrity rather than denigrate him in any way. Is that clear? Yes, okay, you let him know, won't you? Okay, no, we've talked about it. Okay, how should Australians be governed? And here I'm going to make the following suggestions quite briefly, and we near, uh, this is the implications. We live in a solid, well-run, safe, wealthy democracy. How did we arrive here? Well, we understood human evil. We understood that God, the, our constitution refers to God, you understand. Thankfulness to Almighty God. How did we arrive here? And what must we attend to? These are my suggestions. And here it really is. This is my, my ideas. And you can no doubt do better. Quarrel all you like. As long as you believe God's in charge and, sinners, and human beings are sinners, I don't care. All right. How should Australia be governed? It must assume sin. It must assume individual preciousness and the necessity for community. If you say to me, what does that look like? I would say that looks like guarding the family. Is an, it would be a number one priority in government because of the essential nature of family, and I, I don't just mean marriage, I mean family, for the well-being of, human, of human, human beings. And we have, in, in government policy has, 
been party to the destruction of family. That must change. While acknowledging the individual preciousness of all people. So not collectiveness. We do respect the individual. Not discrimination based on wealth, status, popularity, ethnicity, etc., etc. Not individualism, but relationship. Here's a practical suggestion. Uh, some time ago, one of our governments uh, tried to sort of change the shape of the working week so that uh, everybody had two days off, but they were different two days. So the factories could be open on Sundays. The whole idea of paying people extra for weekend work was done away with, and the community would now live uh, five days a week, but different five days, which mean that the families, in other words, sport, in other words, church, in other words, would have to occur spotty during the week while the factories went on building things. I believe that was absolutely, it could have been good economics, but it was very bad from the point of view of family and the good of the community. I'd oppose it. Uh, attending to the first duties of love and justice and safety. Uh, sometimes in the absolute, <laughs> it's difficult running this country, very difficult, but nonetheless we've got to recognise the fundamental duty of government is justice. Providing justice in the community, and, or providing for justice in the community, and likewise safety. In other words, as Jesus did in uh, uh, Isaiah 11, uh, justice between people. Uh, we have justice in many ways, thank God, developed over many years through the system which we have. Thank God for it. It's not true in another co other countries. Um, the government at all levels is under the rule of law. Thank God for that. If that goes, we will be living in a very different country. The rule of law is immensely important, but likewise the defence of the nation. A government that neglects the defence of the nation is doing us all a great damage, both within, namely through the police forces, and without. We need police forces and, and armies and, uh, and military forces which respect government, and we do have them, and will do what the government, not try to take over the government but we also need them to be operating in the service of the community and not as separate powerhouses. And we need them to be operating very well indeed, don't we, for the defence of this nation. Um, a practical illustration of this that you may like to think about, the first duties of, of love, justice, is the response to COVID. And that's a very, uh, it's a hotly disputed one, isn't it? but it was government at least trying to provide for justice and safety. Allowing for the distribution of power, allowing for the distribution of power. That is to say, uh, all power in one hand is extraordinarily dangerous. And so our system, well set up, and I believe uh, influenced by the Bible, uh, has the judiciary as separate from the executive arm of government and uh, the public service, again, being a public service, and the legislature and the people voting, I think all these things are important to see a, a separation of powers so that no one power belongs to, and no one person has the power and therefore tyranny will follow. We see this by the way, and we may care to think through the implications of this no time now in regard to the media. Hmm. Well, I'll stop there. Okay. If you belong to uh, if you belong to the media, that's good. We need Christians in the media. We have a number, and uh, it's extraordinarily important that if you're going to have a healthy Australia, you will need to have uh, truth-telling uh, uh, media. Uh, and one that, uh, and that means people who want to read or listen, who want to know the truth, not just fulfil their uh, uh, prejudices. It's a big ask. Uh, we need to uh, authorise. I've said that, haven't I? Authorise a proper accountability, 
hierarchy, well, remembering, in other words, that God will be the judge of all, we must accept that law and education require human transformation. In a sense, this is the most important of all. We're living in a highly moralistic age when people are beating us over the head about all sorts of sins, imagined or otherwise. Uh, but they, sin, they, in the absence of God in the lives of many of such people, they've filled their lives with a, with a moral fire rather than God, uh, who is the moral fire, if you like, uh, they tend to believe that they will fix the problems of Australia, whatever they are, using the law and using education. The result in the education system is there for all to see. And with the law, the ever-increasing legal burden, because that's how we'll fix the problem of sin. But I've got a secret thing to tell you. It won't educate devils and you'll get educated devils. <laughs> Lord, when you get an increase in law and legalism, you'll just have cleverer and cleverer people going around the law. There are cases going on at this very moment that suggest exactly that. They are not the answers. The answer has to, there is no answer until, that's what Isaiah 11 told us, that the answer is in, in the age to come. There is no answer in this world. Utopia is not possible in this world. There is no perfect church in the world. We know that. But at the heart of any good we can do, and the heart of the good that's in this country, that is, is to do with transformation through relationship. Relationship with God, which helps begin the process of transforming human beings and making us the sort of men and women that we should be. Out of that has come professional ethics. Very strange that your doctor should be committed to you. The, the whole professional thing that we take for granted is a fairly modern invention, you realise. And uh, the public service, likewise. Where do these things come from? I believe they've come from transformational power of the gospel and helping people to be rather more like the sort of people that we ought to be. Now, time's run out, so I'll just quickly explain what uh, the next three are. Acknowledging that government is not the nation. We need to remember that, don't we? We keep thinking Canberra is everything. No, it's not. It's a little bit of the country. We're a nation, we're not a government. And we need to acknowledge that, particularly in the raising of children. It's not the business, it's not the first business of the, of the state to raise our children. It's our, the parents who raise the children. Accepting that the centre exists to serve the local, next. Uh, this is called the principle of subsidiarity or the principle of decentralisation. Uh, we need to recognise the most Im that it's very important that we don't think Canberra... I know Canberra thinks it's everything, I know that, but it's very important the rest of us see that the local is so important, that the football teams, that the clubs, and preeminently that the churches are where the real Australia is. It's the local, and the centre should serve the local, not the other way around. And then uh, animating citizens to bear responsibility. And this goes back to that transformation I talked about. The gospel power to create neighbourliness. I am a great believer in the trade union movement. I don't know whether I believe in our trade unions, but I'm a great believer in the importance of trade unionism and the way in which people are allowed to get together and work together for the common good. Especially, of course, the church falls into that category, and especially the local church. Don't look to the government to solve all our problems. And if I may suggest to you, one of the things that you can do is to get in touch with those who, uh, who are responsible for local things and encourage and strengthen them. So now, quickly, conclusion on being an Australian Christian. I know I have this somewhere, where is it? Come, come, quickly, quickly. I can feel eyes upon me. <laughs> it's, 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 it's this man here. 
But we did start two minutes later than I said. Okay, right, conclusion, being an Australian Christian. Here is my advice for being an Australian Christian. This is just my advice, remember, <coughs> there it is. Christians rule well in whatever circumstance where you are doing the ruling, make sure you rule like that you govern like Christ in your own sphere of responsibility through love, through concern for the other, through service of the other, and bearing in mind the essential nature of forgiveness. Secondly, live for Christ with integrity in your neighbourhood and your nation. We need citizens who are Christians, but not just Christians, men and women of integrity who can be trusted, who will not cheat in business, whose word will be truth. We need to model this and to be this in our neighbourhood, in our nation. We need to take re appropriate responsibility in state and nation. For example, I would suggest get to lo know your local member, write, join a party if you like. Uh, remember, keep which party you join to yourself, so to speak. We how you vote is neither here nor there. Isn't that wonderful? It's part of being Australian. Transcend the media. Find out the truth. Pray. The Bible tells us to pray for those in authority. We need to do it in church. We need to do it constantly, praying for those who have authority. That's one of the chief businesses of being an Australian Christian. And finally, go to church, won't you?